Okay, welcome back. The reason why I was, uh, I would say, waiting a little bit longer than what I usually do with a break is because I wanted to get to just before the example. <laughs> so, but I mean, sometimes I will kind of forget to look at the clock. I can get going for hours, um, it's no problem. So please raise your hand and say, nah, could you find a spot if you feel that we all need it? It's also good for me to have a break. So there will probably be one or two times where I don't do it. I mean, I try to aim at somewhere between quarter two and a little bit before nine. That's the time when it's good time to have a break. Um, I hope you agree with that. Um, but if I, for some reason, forget, I'm just a human. <laughs> so, a very quick example. We'll make it small. We have n observations here. And, well, what we'll do is to use this formulation that we just looked at for the linear trend model, or global linear trend model, as opposed to the local linear trend model, we call them at once, and then time relative to the current time, the observations, and we label this x6, and we can easily identify at least sum of six ones, that's easy, sum of the numbers from, I have it here, from zero to five, oh, that's 15, from zero to five square, I don't know how many of us knows that sum of the squared numbers. I don't, but 55 is the correct number. You can check it if you like. And then we have the inner product with x6 transpose and y gives you this. And you take the inverse of this to get this and multiply with this. So the number of operations is fairly small. You can say at first, well, you have to reconstruct this, and you don't do this after the first observation. Why don't you do it after the first observation? Do you recall? We made these formulas down here, how to update H, and I wiped out F. Why don't we solve for theta 1? Uppercase F1 is the following. Why don't we estimate theta 1? It's not invertible. How many observations do you need before it's invertible? Two, exactly. Then if you get to two, the estimate of the variance is uncertainty is zero. If you fit a straight line to two points, it goes directly through both. So you have no uncertain estimate of the uncertainty. So in practice, you can start doing things that uh, are potentially meaningful from around three observations, but, I mean, if you can wait a little bit longer before having to come with an answer, please do. I, I'll show you what happens when you don't wait too long. Your estimate of the uncertainty is just mm, extremely large, and that's how life is. Anyways, we get an estimate here, 3.9, is the intercept, that means 3.9 is also, if you go back to the data here, 3.9 is also the estimate that we have at time 6. So what is the estimate that we get at time 7? Just to one decimal point. It's sort of written somewhere. So how do we 
go forward and backwards in time. We have it like this, right? If you want to go one step forward in time, what is f of 1? Yes? Um, let me just think. Something tells me that then there must be an error somewhere else, if that is the case. Um, the error must be in the inverse there, because that number is correct. Let, let me check that afterwards and update it if it's needed. <laughs> I'll, I'll need a, or someone, please just invert that matrix. Because that's that, that's where the error is. Because I know I know those numbers out there are correct. <laughs> so, anyways, how do you go one step forward in time? If of one, what is that? Well, we define it. This is f of j that we have written down there. So it's just a 1, 1. So if you have the 1, 1 transposed on theta, basically what you do is you just sum those two numbers. Get 4.2 something. Now I'll hurry away from this slide. <laughs> but you're right. Looking at the numbers, it was kind of These should all be negative. I will update the slides and upload a new version. Let, let's look at it afterwards. It's easy to fix. But I know because the reason why I said the numbers out there are correct bec is because of this slide. And, and here I entered the number directly and this is not copied from somewhere, it's the code that is evaluated using Knitter. So that slide is made using Knitter. So I know that when I enter the correct numbers, I get those things out. I just have to type F6 inverse and to see what it is. Notice one thing that I did here. I did not actually calculate the inverse of X6. What I did do was to solve F6, H6. So what I did was I have my F6, and then I, what I want to solve, I want to find my theta 6. <coughs> I solve the normal equation. Like I go from this form, and I solve for this one. Just like how you learn to do things in the algebra. Right? There's no reason first calculating the inverse of this and then pre-multiplying it. That's just something we do when we do things pen and paper. Numerically, you want to do things like this. So that's why I did it like that. And then I also did it using a linear regression model and get the same. I have a zero implicit there because my x here contains a column of ones already. And I don't want to have two intercepts because then my estimation problem is not well defined because my design matrix does not have full rank. If I have two columns of ones, they are of course collinear. So I can plot my estimate. Of course, we looked at the predictor, and what we just said before was we have a 3.9 as the intercept at our reference time. And then it's just plus minus the slope relative to how many steps you want to go forward and backwards from there. And an estimator of the variance, well, th those are the residuals that we had. I won't check those here. Divided by 6 minus 4 degrees of freedom, 
because we have six observations and we estimated two parameters. This is exactly why if you only had two observations, you divide by two minus two. We've all learned, I think, that that's not a good thing to do, right? You can divide by one, but you want n to be much larger than p. So we get an estimate of sigma that is roughly 0.5. Then we can get the estimator of the variance of any prediction that we have by using the definition here. We can write it out in this case. Symbolically, we can have the 1L multiplied on this matrix. And notice here that there's a zero that wasn't, was there before that is not, no longer here. Is that the error from before? Yeah. It's just a zero that should be removed. <laughs> because then it also matters, since this is three times larger, it, it will become positive. Good. <laughs> Copy paste sometimes solve things <laughs> and avoid errors, but not here. Anyways, so basically you get a second order polynomial for the variance. Just as we discussed last week, you get this parabola around the line from your for your uncertainty. And if you look at the one step prediction, well you get the four point two as we just discussed, and then the estimator of the standard error. Well, the, the reference is 0 0.45 from before, but from here, it gets a little bit higher from what is added here. So, what we will typically give as a measure of uncertainty is either what is the variance or standard deviation, or we'll give it as a, say, either 90 or 95% confidence interval or prediction interval. What is the Expected value plus minus the correspond the relevant quantile in the C distribution times the standard deviation, and you get this range. And if we plot it, it looks like this. Now, what happens next? We get to time seven. We made a prediction, and then our prediction was. 4.2 plus minus 1.3. Then we get something that is actually somewhat below 3.5. It's quite a bit below 4.2, but it's okay because it's well within our estimated prediction interval. So we're not as such surprised. What we do now is we update F7 by taking F6 and then we just add the, the needed element to that. Likewise, we update H7 by pre modding by the inverse of L on our H6 plus a 1, 0 on a 3, on 3 and a half. That's also fairly easy. And then we can do the calculations. And here I think things are still correct. Yes. As in, this is actually the inverse of that. If you look at the estimate here, what has changed? Maybe we should go back a few slides. There's no chalk here. So the estimator that we got for theta 7 and theta 6 but let's just take theta 7 now that we are here. 3.896 and 0 0.250. And let's go back and find the numbers here. The estimator 3.905. Three two eight. Is this as expected? One thing that is always good is to, whenever you get a result, 
before telling anyone about it, look at it and say, does it make sense? I mean, hands up. Who has made a mistake in a calculation at some point in time? <laughs> okay. So, we've all done that, right? So, if you see it before your neighbor that you did it, it's nice, right? So, always kind of look at it and say, does this make sense? Reflect on it. What did we expect? I wiped it out. We expected the intercept to represent the new level, right? And we had a positive slope of roughly 0.3, but the intercept dropped. Huh? Does that make sense? Or did we make an error? I can say it does make sense because our prediction at time 7 was 4.2. So now we get an estimate. So we had a prediction up here. We get an observation down here. And of course, when you have few observations, that means that the new line that you fit has to end ah, yeah, somewhere like this, which means that the estimated intercept could easily drop. And the slope also drops because the observation was below the predicted. So the fact that the slope dropped, that was kind of not a big surprise because we got about one standard deviation below, and we only had six observations before. But the fact that the intercept also dropped is the one thing that maybe is a little bit surprising. Now, to something totally different. For the assignments, what I did was to upload and have made a small document here that gives you guidelines for how to make assignments. I won't read it up loud here because, well, I think you can all read. But there are a few things that I would just want to kind of address in words as well. So there will be four assignments overall. Submit things in, well, I wrote CampusNet here. That's technical part of an insight. Someone cannot really figure out, and some even the IT people still label it CampusNet. But inside, read just inside. But when you look at the site, notice that it still says CampusNet somewhere. I don't know how many of you have realized that so far, but it is there. I have addressed it to the appropriate people, but yeah, not everything changes rapidly, <laughs> for better or worse. Um, assessment, well. You will be doing peer grading of three other reports, basically saying that I will have a lot of questions of the order of 20 some questions. And then by when you read someone else's work, you should kind of score there. How well did they do on this? Did they do this, that or the other? Or did they do something even better? Then when there are some things where people did something that is different from what is expected, either even more be much better or worse or something, you can add comments. Please add comments where there is something that can help the person who did something to understand what the person should have done differently. You learn by reflecting on how someone else did what they did and they also improved by that. I want you to look at three different reports, and there are many, three is a nice number, 
because there's always something that screws up. So some of you will only get two other feedbacks, but two is much better than one. I will go in and look at all assignments also. And if there are some where I say, well, basically what you answered is just totally rubbish. I don't expect that to be the case. I'll come after you some way or the other, not physically. <laughs> I'm not entitled to do that. Um, but I will address that if you do things that is inappropriate. Um, I won't carefully read everything. For those of you who used peer grade before, there's one feature there that I like a lot. That is, after you've had a week for peer grading, then you are allowed to so-called raise a flag. That meaning that if someone said, you did not do the linear regression model, and you claim, well, I actually did do what I was supposed to do, then you can say, well, please, let's have a look at this. I think I actually did what was requested. Then I can go back and say, yes, the one who was assessing you, peer grading you, did not actually read what you did carefully. And then I can change the part of your grade there. I can change the score everywhere. Where you, when you raise a flag, I can change the score. If I see things where things are totally odd, I may add my own peer grading of your report as well. I typically will not write too many comments. I hope that you give constructive comments to each other. Of course, there will be times where I do it. Also, when you raise a flag, don't just raise a flag because then I don't know why. What did you expect? Write a comment. I think I did this, so I should have that score instead of that score. In particular, I like if someone said that someone was trying to please me and gave me much more credit than what I earned. I could ask you to grade your own report in the same way as well. That's an option. I tend to not do it. Um, but if you like to kind of have that as a reference, I think it could be fun to do it. I don't know about you. What I can say is that when you are at that point in time, doing the actual peer grading of your own will take you some five, 10 minutes. Because hopefully you know what you wrote. The big challenge for you, as I also discussed a little bit in the break, is when you get out in the real world, you have to communicate to someone who's not an associate professor or something. You have to communicate with peers. And here you have peers that actually understand your language. So it's easier. Out in the Afterwards, you have to communicate with people that are outside your profession even. So what I want you to do is also focus on how you write things. So it's not just me who can try to guess what you meant, but someone else can actually read it and understand it. And to see the differences in how you can formulate things, that's also why I want you to look at three different reports. Because I, can, I, will, I will not guarantee you, but they are all different. And some are very different. I've experienced once that someone said, well, I know who, it's sort of anonymous. So it's up to you to make it anonymous or not. You can add your name. Um, so if you say that I work together with this person, so I know pretty much everything in this report, well, you can easily peer grade it. Because the only difference is that you know what the intention was behind the words. So maybe it's easier for you to understand what was going on. But you should still be able to peer grade it, even though you know who did it. They will be randomized. So at random, you will see someone whom you know report at some point in time. At least some of you will. It's not a challenge to make it work. That's my experience. Um, I hope you agree. As said, I will make the answers the, and questions the way that I tend to do it when I correct things myself. So it's fairly easy for me to do it. What is tricky is to create the options for the answers. <coughs> because how do I make that list so it's adequate to cover 
all your potential answers. And that's where it's sometimes a, a challenge. So what I do is that I give you all the answers, all the options to see them before you can start peer grading. And then you can comment on them and say there's something here that should be updated. And then we can update it before you start peer grading because then everything, then we can kind of resolve issues before they arise. Okay, um, for the technical perspective, that's a, a long speech about that. And the other thing that I, is here is what is a good answer? I, would, I discussed a little bit about it. And, and I think what one thing is to say, yes, you should be readable for someone else, but also keep it tr in mind that, well, your peers have the same reference background as yourself. So you don't have to copy a textbook. Make references to the equations that you use, or the methods, or the slide, whatever you use. Don't write too much, write what is appropriate. It's the comments that you write yourself, that's where you add value. Not spending half a page defining your model. So do it briefly, reference what you've used, but it's just fairly brief unless you are asked to do something analytically. Of course, then it should be clear what the steps are. I think I've said this before. What is an estimate? Well, always have some measure of uncertainty. A point value, the likelihood of having the likelihood of having 3.905 as the correct value for theta. Slim, right? Maybe four was the value that was used in the simulation. I don't know. Always provide a measure of uncertainty. So a typical question is, can I use this or that tool to do the modeling? Yes, you can, if you believe the tool is doing the right thing. You run the risk that if the tool did something different than what is expected, you just get the wrong answer and no one can see the details. So there are, in particular, in the first assignment, I encourage you to do the coding kind of yourself. All the algorithms, it's not too much, but it's some. And in the later, you kind of get to a point where you kind of just use the functions and methods that we have used doing the lectures and doing examples and so on. So find your way through it. If you have a tool that does something nice and neat, you can always use that to check your solution. Figures, make them carefully. One typical thing, it's not going to affect your grading, but I mean, how many of you have looked at reports where you have figures, the numbers on the axis are at a point where you pretty much need binoculars or whatever to read it. Please make axis numbers, stuff like that, have about the same font size as the text. Then everything is just nice. And it also helps the reader seeing what you actually did. So consider the size of fonts. Don't just make it messy. But of course, it's not the overall performance or how, how things look like. That is not what kind of determines the grade in the end. I tend to have an o a question in the end, say, well, how do you find this overall, where you can get a little bit of credit for that, but that's not what kind of matters the most. Um, regarding code, you're all going to do some coding somewhere, just making plots. Have all that code as an appendix so that if there is something that the reader cannot understand, you can go down and look at what actually happened. In particular, when I'm going to read things, I would say in every fourth or fifth assignment I read, I go into the code and say, well, the wording was not accurate. But from reading the code, I can see what happened. And then I can be nice if you actually did the right thing and just wasn't able to write it. So do include your code. 
I know you're going to use different languages. It's not a problem. The challenge here, working in groups, is something where, well, we all learn more by helping each other. I think I've said that a lot of times. So I also want you to help each other. But on the other hand, you don't learn much by sitting and looking at someone else doing the coding on his PC, right? I don't know how many of you have been in groups doing that. You're sitting three around one computer, one is typing, the other is just listening and saying, oh, you need a comma there. Five minutes later, maybe that should be a T. That's not how you learn. You learn, th you learn things to get it working by doing it yourself. So please make your own implementation and then compare your results rather than copy and pasting code to each other. The important thing is, as I mentioned before, it's your comments on that. That's where you want to differentiate yourself. But also, when you did work together, just on the front page, mention, I work together with this and that person. Name and student number. Because when you go, when you submit this, I won't go and check everything. But there's a system called Urkund, I don't know if you know it, but it looks at everything that is handed in and compares it to everything else it can look at. And it will say that whenever you copy text from the assignment, it will look at someone else who did the exact same text and say, whoa, this is plagiarism. Mm, yeah, but it's okay. Uh, so sometimes you get something that is red or yellowish without having, having things done there. The worst thing I've seen is someone who copied someone else's thing in Word, I think. The original was in LaTeX. There was a, an equation that he did not bother to enter, so that was copied in as a grab of the picture. Um, then you get filed to 101, also prior to that. Uh, so, but if you have listed someone else as collaborators, and there is some similarity in the code, because you did some comments that are like, it's not plagiarism, because you said what you did. As long as your comments are individual, it's fine. And it's me who makes that decision, and how I tend to do things is, in the first assignment, if there are things that are a bit too close, I just say it. If it's, and that, that happens sometimes, and then you just find what is the right level. It's not a big problem, I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just do what you ought to do. And then with everything will be fine. But do also help each other, because you can spend a lot of time on some of these things, and I know that you can save a lot of hours trying to fix a bug that you cannot find by helping each other. And those are the hours where you're not constructive. <laughs> and we've all been there. So, regarding help, the way that I do this is in Insight, I will, in the afternoon today, I'll send out a message saying, ask, add a comment here if you have a question. Because when you add comments to that message, everyone can see the answers that I will post. And whenever you add a comment there, I will get a mail and then I can go in there. So I won't go and check it all the time, I'll just wait until I get a message. And then I will add my answers in line there as well. So that everyone gets the same help. Of course you can ask questions here as well, but I prefer to have everything, or at least almost everything there, so that everyone gets the same help. I don't know how many of you would have a strong preference for doing this in Danish. Are there any? Because uh, officially, you're fine. it's fine with me that you do it in, in Danish. I tend to say that if there are a sufficient group that wants to do things in Danish, then I will do the peer grading so that those writing in Danish will only peer grade other things in Danish, and then English is its own. I know that anyone in here should be able to peer grade in English, but not anyone should be able to do it in Danish. But are there anyone who would consider doing it in Danish? Because otherwise, I would say, I would change this to say, I expect it to be English. 
Is it a? Yeah, no, I, I thought it would be nice. Yes. I think that the challenge in doing things in Danish is to find the right words some places, but that's. How many would like to do it in Danish? Please raise your hand. Just if it's just one, then we can talk about how we do things. Let, let's just do that afterwards. Um, I mentioned knitter. So this was what I wanted to say about how we do assignments. I don't know if you have any questions. Nothing. Silence. When there are questions, let's take it from there. Um, the way it works time-wise is that the first assignment will be available at 11 o'clock today, so that you have time to read it. And if there is something that is unclear, then we can discuss it before noon. You will not have the foundation from what I've lectured up till today to do everything. You can get started. You need what is the content of next week. I had planned that I could maybe kind of give the introductions to that today and maybe I will do it. I haven't decided yet. Um, that's also up to you. Otherwise, you, you can see the lecture from last fall is online, so you can go and see it if you want to get started. So I will encourage you as a kind of warming up for next week's lecture, do the reading and get started on the assignment, because then you can have the questions answered next week. And then you can ask the, the right questions, and then if, I, if there's a question that is asked and say, well, everyone should have that answer, then I will update that. I must say that uh, the formulation was made last night. There was something else due to my vice dean job currently. Uh, I did not have as much time to update the assignment as I wanted to have. So there may be some typos that we want to update. So please, when you read through it, I'm open for doing edits and stuff like that, just to make sure that things are clear. And if we can get that done over the weekend, that would be perfect. Um, next week is my last week as vice dean here at DTU. Then I'll get back to just being an associate professor, but that also gives me more time to prepare things for this. But I thought it would be kind of odd to have someone standing in for the first four weeks, and then I could jump in and take the rest. Um, so the, the past weeks here, I've been doing a one and a half man's job. Is that, that's just life. Uh, we get by, all of us, I hope. Uh, but that's also why I'm, I'm very open to comments, to wordings, and is this clear or not? Good. That was the info about assignments. I should have looked at Maybe I should just add some words to what is going to happen next week. Um, ah, let me just... So... I'll just give you the brief introduction to the motivation for last week, because next week, because the challenge is this x transpose x. The way we do things now, globally, it's still the numerical challenges that I kind of motivated this formulation with are still there. The place where things are starting to differ is, well, first of all, models are approximations, right? There's only one truth, one reality. So all models are wrong, some are useful. And that, the question is, can we make a model that fits all our data? Or should we just make a model that is good for a certain portion of the data? That's kind of the lead in to next week. So we can have what is called exponential smoothing. 
This will actually not be in the assignment. But the idea is that you start to have some weights. And then you say that everything that is old, let's just forget about that. And focus on the most recent past. How do we do this? So instead of having a global trend model, we'll go for local trend models. That was just the wordings just to say that's a teaser for what's going to happen next week. But that's also, so now with those words, you can read through the assignment. And most things will make sense when you read it with just those added words. But I won't go in and do the full lecture now because